makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with the conversations that matter. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. BOJ officials edge closer to raising interest rates. Bloomberg has been told the decision hinges on Friday's initial numbers from spring wage talks with the outcome too close to call. U.S. futures are higher as markets wait for U.S. CPI data. Meanwhile, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon says a recession isn't off the table, adding that the Fed should wait before cutting interest rates. Plus, UK wage growth eases and unemployment rises for the first time since July, relieving some of the inflationary pressures that have concerned the Bank of England. And coming up, we're going to speak to the CEO of Novo Nordisk owner, Novo Holdings, whose income has surged thanks to an obesity drug sales boom. Let's check in on these markets then. Moderately risk on across European equities after the little bit of softness that we got through across European and US stocks yesterday. FTSE 100 here in the UK so far putting in a decent session. Gains of nine-tenths of a percent as you can see. Worth noting as well that the UK gilt markets are bid with yields down on that softer labour data, wage data and of course the unemployment rate here in the UK just ticking up. Over in France the Cacaron is just up just a tenth of a percent. A slightly brighter picture over in Germany where you're seeing gains of three-tenths of a percent. And over over in Italy, the FTSE MIB currently putting in gains of two tenths of a percent. Spanish IBEX up close to half of 8%. Let's split the board because of the course, the data point of the day. Now we've moved on from the Labour data of the UK is the CPI print, of course, of the US crossing the line 1.30 p.m. UK time with an expectation that core year on year will be around 3.7%. How that informs, of course, the Fed's decision making going forward will be crucial. S&P futures pointing to gains so far, two tenths of a percent, just below that 5,200 level. NASDAQ futures pointed to gains of 67 points, up four tenths of a percent at 18,200. 282. And the European benchmark, again, as I said, so far in the session, gains of four-tenths of a percent, back above 500, adding two points so far this Tuesday. Let's flip the board and look cross-asset then with a focus on some of the currencies, of course, the pound in focus for us today, and the Japanese yen, the banking uh, central bank story of the moment. The Japanese yen currently softer by three-tenths of a percent. That's the strength coming through of the dollar versus the yen, down three-tenths of a percent for the Japanese yen. So far in the session, as Bloomberg reports, that the decision on when to hike interest rates is very finely balanced as to next week, March or April. Currently, the US two-year, by the way, as we build back to that CPI print, currently at 452. Not a lot of movement so far. A bit of a holding pattern before you get that detail on the inflation story of the US. And the pound, under pressure, two-tenths of a percent again after the wage data and the unemployment rate ticked up. The wage data came in a little softer. So a little bit of pressure on the pound. Again, gilts a bid, 127 on pound. Let's get to the Japan story then. Bank of Japan officials are edging closer to raising interest rates. They will decide whether to move this month at next week's policy meeting with the outcome currently, as I said, too close to call. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Paul Jackson then, who's been following all of this for us. Paul, what are the key factors that could swing the decision then? Uh, well, I think uh, you've already mentioned uh, uh, the idea of wages. Uh, Bank of Japan has been looking very closely at the wage trend. It says wages must feed in to prices in order to get a positive inflation cycle in Japan. Remember that Japan's been having problems pushing prices up for uh, decades. Uh, so it's a, a bit of a different situation to uh, other economies. Now, we have some wage data coming through on Friday. This is from Japan's biggest union federation. And we already know from last week that the average demand this year was 5.85% compared with 4.49% last year. So a lot more demand uh, coming through. That suggests that the overall figure of the annual pay deals reached should be significantly higher uh, than last year. And that's the kind of information that could convince the board at the Bank of Japan that March is the time to move. Yeah, the importance then of that union data, as you say, coming out on Friday and the focus on that. What kind of number then, Paul, are, are we looking at that could move the dial for the Bank of Japan when it comes to that union data out on Friday? Hey, look, the first tally last year was 3.8%. Uh, and I think anything below that, obviously, it's all bets off, right? 
I think actually anything mm. under 4% would be a bit of a disappointment at this point. Our BOJ mm. survey of 50 economists uh, says 4.1% is what they're expecting. But hey, look at that uh, demand figure of 5.85. If you subtract about three quarters of a percentage point off that, like last year's uh, result, that could even get us to the 5% range. Hey, if it's 5% range, <laughs> I think you can bet quite a lot on a March move. OK, so 5% looking for that, and that could be the catalyst then for a March move. Excellent anal analysis and context. Paul Jackson, thank you very much uh, indeed on the ground for us, of course, in Japan on the back of that story. Let's bring you to this point then, Claudia Pensari, Chief Investment Officer for France at UBS Global Wealth Management. Claudia, thank you for joining us. And we'll start, before we get to CPI in the US and your reaction to what we're seeing here in the UK with the data on wages, let's start with the BOJ then and where and how you are thinking about the next decision for the Bank of Japan and how to position around that. Hi, good morning. Yeah, so I, uh, the, the situation is about uh, the Bank of Japan ending uh, the zero-rate monetary policy. I was listening just the, the discussion you had about the wage, uh, everything which is above 3.5%, probably 4%, will be something to watch. Clearly, the market is already anticipating when you look, uh, for instance, what the market is expecting for rates one year forward. Everyone is expecting uh, this change in the monetary policy and the yen is reappreciated since uh, uh, the last week. So clearly, there is a market expectation which is back in already. And, and Claudia, the Nikkei up about 40% in, in the last 12 months, down in the last few sessions, of course, on, on what has been transpiring around the details in terms of the next steps for the Bank of Japan. You're neutral on Japanese stocks. What turns you more constructive on Japanese equities? We are being neutral overall because you also need to think about the currency. So for clients which are not edge, the performance of the Nikkei and the topics is not the same. So it's a neutral position also based on the currency uh, positioning. We had some exposure in our mandate. We have some exposure through option. We also have uh, across the different mandate position, which more exposed to value Japanese stock versus the topics itself. So it's a neutral because we found the value exposure uh, through the index itself. Uh, the, there are few elements. The valuation now is more expensive than it was a year ago. Currency consideration is also important. There is essentially a growth, which is positive, of course, uh, but clearly the valuation is not as attractive as, as it was a year ago. We, we have a relative, let's say, relative trade and a neutral recommendation on it. OK, still, still neutral with, with that recommendation around Japan and Japan stocks, with factoring in, of course, the, the currency question and, and the valuations that have become, as you, as you argue, a little less attractive than they once were. When it, when it comes to the US and Cloudy, with that focus on CPI out later today, does the data point of today change your view longer term on the upside or the challenges facing US stocks? No, I think uh, today uh, is another CPI day. We will have a lot of volatility around the data. We still expect uh, inflation coming down. We still expect the economic growth in the U.S. slowing. And we still expect uh, the Fed cutting rate in June with a total rate cut of 75 basis points by the end of the year. I think CPI data, there are a lot of citation today. Consensus is expecting for 0.4%. Uh, if anything else below the point four will be positive, anything else above will be negative. We know how it works. It's a very volatile day. But uh, what is important, I think, is the market has normalized expectation about interest rate cuts. Expectation end of the last year was probably too positive, having more than 150 basis point rate cut was a not sense considering how strong still the U.S. economy is. OK, so an expectation that maybe the Fed goes, Fed goes in June and you're looking for anything below 0.4 in, in terms of a positive catalyst for U.S. stocks. Are U.S. stocks looking a little frothy for you at this point, Claudia? Are you concerned about concentration risks? Are things looking a little stretched? Uh, listen, I think uh, U.S. market is not cheap, be honest. Uh, but uh, when you break down the overall market, you see some value. 
if you take out uh, the few biggest market cap, valuation around 17 times, 70.3 times. And when you look into equally weighted U.S. market index, valuation is even cheaper. So I think uh, for clients which want to be U.S. exposed, having an exposure to some stocks and be, let's say, very selective, make a lot of sense. We are still positive on IT. Uh, we are positive on industrial. You have industrial story, which is still very attractive in U.S. with reonshoring defense fencing, but we're also positive on pharma stocks, which have been underperforming over the last two years. So clearly, you need to be exposed to U.S. market. It's one of the biggest in the world, mm. but you need to be more selective now than a few months ago because valuation for the overall index is now cheap. OK, they need to be selective then in this environment. Jamie Dimon uh, of JP Morgan uh, saying that he is concerned that potentially a recession is still in the cards for the, for the US. Are you firmly in the soft landing camp when it comes to the US economy? Yes, yeah, so we, we are still in the soft landing camp and we have been in the soft landing camp for a long period of time. The data is slowing down. The employment data on Friday was pretty clear. We had a pickup in employment. It's not huge. Inflation will come down. Of course, uh, if we have still a long period of time when interest rates stay at 5%, probably things can get uh, uh, more tricky. But uh, when you look into the data, there is slowdown. We will have inflation data. Recession is not on the card, at least in the coming 6, 12 months. Wow. OK, recession's not on the card. I'm looking at gold as a potential hedge, Cloudy. You've been thinking about this. If you want exposure to gold, is there, is there further, run, further to run? Is gold looking stretched? And do you want exposure directly to the yellow metal or to the miners? Listen, I think uh, there is still upside on the gold. Uh, we almost reached our target, uh, uh, a target that we have for the end of the year. But uh, with real rates moving down, with uh, geopolitical risk still on, uh, gold and other, let's say, low-risky uh, asset makes sense in the asset allocation right now. Uh, volatility has been pretty low so far, and uh, the ER see a lot of risk coming, U.S. election, volatility, European election. So I think having defensive asset makes sense, and gold included. OK, the hedging qualities of gold as we think about the US politics and the call that the Fed could go with its first cut in June. Claudia Pansero with the analysis this Tuesday. Thank you very much indeed. Chief Investment Officer for France at UBS Global Wealth Management. Coming up, Generali posts better than expected profit. We are CEO Philippe Donnet, how the Italian insurer navigated 2023 and its natural disasters. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Generali has reported better than expected fourth quarter profit with the Italian insurer set to boost payouts to shareholders. I spoke to Philip Donnet, the CEO of Generali earlier, and asked what he thought was behind the earnings beat. No, I think that uh, our uh, business uh, uh, portfolio, our life uh, insurance business is uh, extremely diversified, extremely focused on protection, uh, on uh, unique links, so it's less and less relying on interest rates. So the sensitivity to interest rates is definitely uh, much lower than what it was before. So we uh, were able to have a growing and profitable business in a low interest rate environment, uh, and we will continue uh, whatever the uh, scenario, the, the interest rate scenario will be in the future we will continue having a growing and profitable life insurance business. Mm. And you talked about the record costs, the record high costs of, of catastrophes. Is, is that the new normal for, for Generali? Is that the new normal for the insurance sector? Uh, who knows? Uh, what we know is that definitely the climate change has a, a negative impact on both the frequency and the intensity of natural catastrophes. This is what we have seen in the past in the past few years. Uh, in Europe, uh, 2023, 
has been a, a very bad year in terms of natural catastrophes. So for us, the cost was uh, over 1,100 million, uh, which is, as I said, a record high cost. And we will see if it's going to be a, a, a new normal. We expect significant uh, natural catastrophes for 2024, but not at this level. Are you able to give us, I understand, are you able to give us any details, though, in terms of, in terms of what you might be looking at in a potential acquisition target, or indeed what, what region and what area of the world you might look, be looking to, to expand your footprint? But, you know, we are um, considering a very strict and disciplined uh, framework for m a that allows uh, value creation. And we've been defining at the beginning of this strategy, of, of the current strategic cycle, we've been uh, disclosing this uh, this uh, framework from m and uh, All the acquisitions we made uh, in uh, during the plan, especially the, the last two acquisitions, Liberty Seguros and Conning, were fully in line with the, the uh, framework we, we disclosed for m and mm -hmm. So we will continue uh, being very consistent with the, this uh, framework. Uh, we will consider uh, operation that have uh, strategic, financial, and cultural fit, and that are uh, a potential value creation opportunity. Okay, the Generali CEO, Philip Donis, speaking to me earlier. That stock, by the way, up eight tenths of a percent, currently up 33% uh, in the last 12 months, up eight tenths of a percent so far in the session. A different story, though, for Porsche, and we'll check in on their share price right now. Disappointment in terms of their outlook for margins for the year. Operating margins set to come in between 15 to 17 percent for Porsche, weaker than analyst expectations below the company's midterm goals. They also saw sales slumping in China by 15 percent. So a challenge they have talked about 2024 as being a transition year. You're actually seeing the stock up 1.2 percent uh, so far in the session. It took a bit of a, a knock earlier on at the outbreak on the back of these earnings, but it's turned around since then. Again, the challenges around uh, China and the operating margin for that German automaker, of course. Coming up, President Biden uh, looking to boost a government spending in his 7.3, yes, 7.3 trillion dollar budget proposal, setting up a showdown with fiscal conservatives ahead of the November elections. All the details on that just ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden has unveiled a $7.3 trillion fiscal 2025 budget proposal that would deliver more services, middle class tax breaks and price controls. It would be funded through higher taxes on the wealthy and corporations. Let's get the details then with Bloomberg anchor Kriti Gupta, who's been watching for this and unpacking the detail for us. What stands out to you then, Kriti? What's in this package? Well, just what you said, there are a lot of taxes on not only corporations, but your kind of high net worth individuals. Basically, mm -hmm. if you're making more than $400,000 in the United States, you are in big trouble if you are looking at a Biden 2.0 presidency. Mm. Let me walk you through some of the numbers, though, because it's going to hit businesses in a really big way. He's talking about increasing the corporate tax rate from the current 21 percent to 28 percent. That is a massive increase for a lot of the companies that are driving this global equity rally. And it's not just American companies, it's European companies as well that make a lot of their money in the United States. Look about the earnings that we're talking about. Consumer resilience in the United States continues to be a major theme. On top of that, stock buybacks. And you're seeing that in Europe, you're seeing that in the United States. Now, they, he would quadruple the tax there and actually kind of move a lot of that money, not just to help kind of stem the deficit that you are starting to see become a bigger and bigger issue for the bond market, but also help fund some of the issues. Think of Medicare, think of Social Security for some of the lower tax brackets in the United States. Of course, a lot of the consensus here is that this isn't going to see that much of progress when it hits the House. A Republican-controlled House that have already come out and said this is unrealistic spending that that you're looking at on top of him saying they're only going to increase the defense budget by one percent if you're a republican right now and you hear only a one percent increase when the rest of the world is really investing in their defense spend it's not a good look for president biden okay you edged into territory uh, 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 that i wanted to go into which is number one why do we care if this isn't going to yeah. be implemented the house is divided the senate they have what a, a one seat majority uh, and then the deficit question as well and the question is around that 
Well, let's let's go to the numbers here because yeah. the numbers are not rosy, Tom. One point six trillion dollars a year. That's the estimate from the Biden administration itself on just how much in the deficit is increasing over the next decade. Now, his plan, the one that he proposed, suggests a three trillion dollar reduction in that deficit over 10 years. You've got a couple of trillion dollars there missing. So the deficit is still very much of an issue. And if you remember last fall, you do start to see a lot of pain in the bond market, concerned about whether or not the United States government is going to ultimately shut down. We feel like we get this reiteration, this conversation every couple of months. And, and, and if we continue to see that, to what extent do you see that long end of the curve really see a sell-off? And that's something, by the way, that's been referenced by the Bank of Japan, by the ECB, and right here in the UK by the BOE as well, basically saying that Treasury self, those concerns around the U.S. finances are going to hit the finances and the markets of okay. every other country in the world. Pretty good on the importance of this budget, this U.S. budget, not just for the U.S. domestically, but internationally as well. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, I'm going to be joined by the CEO of Novo Nordisk, owner Novo Holdings, whose income has surged, of course, thanks to those obesity drug sales. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. BOJ officials edge closer to raising interest rates. Bloomberg has been told the decision hinges on Friday's initial numbers from spring wage talks, with the outcome still too close to call. European stocks and U.S. futures are higher as markets wait for U.S. CPI data. Meanwhile, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon says a recession is not off the table, adding that the Fed should wait before cutting interest rates. Plus, UK wage growth eases and unemployment rises for the first time since July, relieving some of the inflationary pressures that have concerns the Bank of England. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Let's check in on these markets for you. As we said, European markets, European stocks are up so far in the session as we build up to that CPI print, the inflation data out of the US and how it informs the Fed's decision. Of course, Jay Powell giving evidence to the committees last week, suggesting that they are getting closer to that point. A little bit more confidence is needed on the data front. Will today provide that with core inflation expected to come in at 3.7% year on year out of the US. US futures then, S&P futures points to the gains of two tenths of a percent. Nasdaq futures looking to add 79 points up, four tenths of a percent. And here in Europe, the benchmark is currently up four tenths of a percent and a decent session so far in the UK with the FTSE 100 up currently around eight tenths of a percent. Yes, the data here in the UK is suggesting a slightly softer labour market and maybe that suggests that the BOE's work is is starting to have an effect. August is when markets expected that first cut. Does that adjust on the back of this data? Let's get now to one of the big corporate stories, though, not just of the moment, but arguably of the last 12 to 24 months. Right now, soaring sales of Novo Nordisk obesity drugs helping to boost the income and investment returns tenfold, tenfold last year for the owner, Novo Holdings. Total income and returns coming in at four and a half billion dollars. Joining me now, is the CEO of Novo Holdings, Kasim Kute. Kasim, thank you very much for coming into the studio. It is the company, oh, really, arguably here. of the moment yeah. here in Europe, at least. And look, there's a lot that goes into the holdings business, but Novo Nordisk is the standout. The sales, of course, of WeGovi and Azempic last yeah. year, powering the returns for you. What do you do with the cash pile that you're now sitting on? Yeah, well, good question, because obviously, as we think through our strategy for the coming years, and actually 23 was the last year of our five of our prior five year strategy so now we have a new strategy in mm. place called strategy 2030 and the big theme there is scaling uh, how do we absorb uh, the phenomenal inflows that are going to be coming our way uh, from the great success of Novo Nordisk and indeed the success of Novo Nessus as well our other operating company make sure we absorb those inflows reinvest them and hopefully generate the attractive returns that we've been able to do historically. And you've already pulled the trigger, of course, on, on a big ticket deal, 16.5 billion US dollar acquisition of Catalent. How confident you, are you at this point that that deal goes through, that antitrust regulators approve it? Yeah, look, I can't comment on that. The regulatory processes are, are what they are, and, and they've got to uh, play their course. What we know is we have to be patient. So if we look back a year ago, uh, we merged two of our portfolio companies, Novo Nordisk and Christian Hansen, to form Novo Nessus. Mm -hmm. uh, that regulatory process took over a year. Uh, so uh, I think all we can do is obviously be patient uh, and make sure that we cooperate fully uh, and transparently uh, with the regulator and hope for 
a closing uh, as soon as possible, obviously, uh, to give clarity to our customers and indeed to the what, employees. What does as soon as possible look like at this point? What is, what is the approximate I, yeah, time frame? I, I, Tom, you know as well as I mean, these yeah. processes take months yeah. and, okay. and it is what it is. Yeah, sure. Are you slightly irked when you hear Eli Lilly's CEO, one of your key competitors, saying they should be referred to antitrust regulators, to competition authorities? Does that, does that get under your skin well, at all? Well, you sort of get used to it, right? We all compete with each other vigorously and Eli Lilly has been a formidable and much respected competitor mm. to Nova Nordisk for many years, right? We are the two world leading insulin and obesity, obesity companies. So. Uh, a bit of back and forth between Lilly and Nova Nordisk is part of the course. OK, and the idea is you take three of these Catalan factories yes. and you sell them to Novo Nordisk. That's the, that's the plan. What Correct. do you do with the rest of the Catalan business then? So the rest of the Catalan business uh, is one uh, that we like a great deal. So the whole area of what we call biopharma services. So if you look at the golden era of innovation that we we're in pharmaceutical-wise, that that innovation needs servicing. It needs things, uh, companies that are called contract research mm -hmm. organizations. It needs uh, contract manufacturing organizations and uh, as well as many other services. So we're heavily invested in this whole biopharma services arena. It's one that we like. It's one that's core to our strategy. And Catalan fits very much in that. So we look forward actually uh, to Hopefully, as soon as possible, getting our hands on that business, investing mm -hmm. behind it and getting it to its full growth potential. And we're very excited by that growth potential, not least because we firmly believe that the biotech industry is off the bottom mm -hmm. uh, from the downturn that happened uh, back in uh, late 20, uh, early 21. We're seeing IPOs come back, which means more funding for the industry, which means more need for contract development manufacturers. So we're feeling pretty good about things. Okay, that's interesting. If, if for some reason the deal doesn't, doesn't go through, part of the rationale for the deal, of course, is to ensure that that capacity that so far Nova Nordisk is, isn't able to match the, the demand, huge demand for, it, for its products around, around the obesity drugs, can't match that demand quite yet. I know they're investing very heavily around that. Part of the rationale of Catalan is to help that. If for some reason it falls through, what is the playbook then to support Nova Nordisk? Well, look, Nova Nordisk, I, mean, I think as the CEO of Nova Nordisk himself uh, has said recently, uh, the Catlin move is, is one piece of the puzzle. There's a host of other initiatives that are taking place uh, to build capacity. There's a lot going on from an organic perspective in terms of uh, expanding facility uh, in existing sites, uh, both in Europe uh, and in the U.S. So... Uh, you know, Catalant is, is an important piece of that, but by no means is it the only piece of the puzzle, and a host of other initiatives are underway. Okay, and it, it sounds like you want to be holding on to the, these drug production facilities and these assets for, for the future. Is that, is that part of, this is a part of a longer-term longer -term strategy? Yeah, well, look, we're a long-term investor, right? If we look at who Nova Holdings are, uh, no. we are very much focused on generating attractive long-term returns. If you look our at our track record with the assets that we do own, it's about long-term investment investing and investing for the growth for the full growth potential of those assets so mm. yes this 16.5 billion it was notable in terms of the, the the price tag does that mark the start of kind of new multi-billion dollar deals for Novo Holdings what, what does that tell us about, uh, about pricing that you're looking at Tom somewhere in the middle I mean I think uh, Catalan in many ways uh, for the strategic reasons you uh, alluded to in relation to Nova Nordisk is a one-off uh, that is not the size of transaction that we've been doing it's not the size of transaction that I expect us to be doing in the foreseeable future. Having said that, mm. if you look at the inflows coming our way in the coming years, we do have to scale and we do have to do bigger deals to put more money to work. So what I would expect in the coming years is for us to be doing bigger investments than we have done the previous five. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they'll quite reach uh, that level of, uh, I mean, 16 and a half is... Yeah. Uh, is, is on the very big side. And that, that, that I would put in the category of one-off, at least for the next five years or okay. so. Okay, interesting. What are the criteria or the metrics that you're looking at when it comes to potential acquisition targets that have to align with your longer-term view? So, look, I mean, as any financial investor, we're looking at generating the right kind of risk-adjusted returns. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we do these investments, we have our IRR targets. But importantly, we're, we're focused on certain sectors where we believe that our strong heritage in life sciences, where our long-rooted and deep insights and network can add value. We often say that we bring more than just capital to our investments, and that's because of the heritage that we have uh, in the life science arena. 
And there's a handful of sectors that we feel uh, we have an edge, and one of them is the biopharma services sector, whether you're talking about CROs or CDMOs. Okay, the, bi the biopharma, uh, biopharma sector within, within life sciences. The biopharma services, services sector. The services so, yes, sector yes. is a particular area, yes. area of focus when yeah. it comes to deal making. Yeah. What about when it, when it comes to the green, green transition? You're looking to, to, to allocate what between, you're going from 2% of allocation to 10% by 2030. Do you meet that? And what specifically falls into that category? Yeah. What are you looking for within green transition? Investments. Tom, very good question, because if you look at our strategy, our new strategy 2030, uh, in many ways it's more of the same with the exception of scaling, i.e. putting more money to work. However, we have called out a couple of new areas uh, where we are going to be doing uh, investments in a slightly different way, and one of them is green technology investing. So there's one area where we've been investing heavily for the last six years and where we're arguably the world leading investor and that's in bioindustrials. So that is biotech solutions for industry, a very important area for the green transition. Three years ago, we went into infrastructure, green infrastructure investing, and we recently formed a fund called Glentra uh, that is uh, focused on uh, green energy investing. But we've recently made a decision as part of Strategy 2030 to invest in green tech and decarbonization technologies more broadly, regardless of whether they have a bioindustrial uh, platform mm -hmm. or not. So we're going to be doing uh, classic recycling, alternative packaging, etc., etc., without necessarily the, the, the biotech angle that we've always focused on historically. So a big area of focus mm -hmm. for us, a big push, and not only because it's important for the green transition, but because we firmly believe that there are going to be some very exciting returns to be generated in that area. Kassam Kutu, we've run out of time, but really appreciate your time today coming to the studio, CEO, of course, of Novo Holdings, on how you're thinking about deploying some of that capital. Tom, really thanks. Appreciate your time. Thank you thank very you. much for having me. Thank okay, you. OK, the CEO there, of course, of Novo Holdings. We're going to bring you some live pictures now, we're hoping to at least. Live pictures as the SpaceX Dragon capsule re-enters the Earth's atmosphere carrying Crew-7. They took off, by the way, August of last year. The six-month mission marks the company's seventh operational human spaceflight to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. It's also, by the way, the 11th time that SpaceX has launched humans into orbit. Led by NASA astronaut and commander Yasmin Mogbelli, the crew includes Danish astronaut Andreas Morgensen of the European Space Agency, Satoshi Furukawa from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and Russian cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. The capsule expected to splash down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. So off the coast of Florida in the next approximately 10 minutes. So the capsule delinked from the International Space Station a number of hours ago, performed a number of maneuvers, and we are now getting these images from a high-altitude aircraft. And we continue to watch this, of course, this manned crew returning and expected to splash down off the coast of Florida in approximately the next 10 minutes or so. We'll keep across, of course, this story for you. Coming up, BOJ officials edge closer to raising interest rates and will decide whether to move this month. The outcome currently too close to call. More on our story next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, Bank of Japan officials are edging closer to raising interest rates for the first time since 2007, by the way. Bloomberg has been told the decision hinges on Friday's initial numbers from spring wage talks. They will decide whether to move this month at next week's policy meeting, with the outcome currently too close to call. For more, I'm joined by, from Tokyo by Takahida Kiyuchi, Executive Economist at Nomura Research Institute. Takahida, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, given what Bloomberg's been reporting, given what we've been hearing from Governor Ueda over the last few days, given what we've been hearing from other officials at the Bank of Japan, what is your view on when they move to raise yeah. interest rates? OK, I think that uh, maybe BOJ will move next week to increase the interest rate hmm. by with... Uh, 70% probability. 
So I think that the financial market uh, expect a 50%, but uh, I, I think that the probability could be higher than the consensus. Because that, as you mentioned, that the BOJ can get the very important information to decide my policy uh, on Friday this week. Uh, that was a uh, result of that spring wage round. That could be a catalyst. That could justify that BOJ to move uh, next week. OK, and so to be clear, you are convinced and you think the Bank of Japan will be convinced by next week that the inflation yep. target is being met and that wages are moving sustainably higher? Yeah, I think that the wage growth rate could be, uh, could be very high, higher than that last week. Uh, that could justify that uh, uh, change of mind policy to the Bank of Japan. Actually, I think that in reality, I think that the 2% inflation goal uh, is not achievable. And the uh, current uh, mm. increase of that wage and the prices could be temporary caused by that uh, uh, increase of uh, import price. And in the coming okay. few years, I think that Takahide, both are the inflation rate. I'm yeah. going to have to interrupt you. We'll come back to this conversation. We are very lucky and okay. very fortunate to have you standing yeah. by. We're just going to yeah. cut in briefly because SpaceX and the splashdown of Crew 7 is imminent. Just in the next few minutes, you can see the four parachutes have now come out of the capsule. Of course, it delinked from the International Space Station earlier in the day. This is a manned crew. There are four people on board from Japan, Russia, Europe and the US. You can see the four shoots now as the speed slows on this capsule as they get closer to splashdown off the coast of Florida. Matt Bloxham, by the way, is standing by as well, an expert on all things SpaceX for us, with the eye across tech, but with the specifics on what's happening in SpaceX. How consequential is this, Mac? Uh, Matt? Just put it in context for us, what we're seeing. Yeah, well, so this is the fifth mission uh, for this particular SpaceX Crew Dragon. So, you know, this has been transformational in terms of the way we take people into space, and particularly to the, the International Space Station as part of this bigger uh, kind of multi-decade program that NASA has, essentially take people to the moon and then maybe at some point on to Mars. So actually, you know, kind of getting people to and from the, the space station, almost like a kind of a shuttle, like a ferry, if you like, mm. uh, and reusing um, these uh, spacecraft brings the cost down, improves the reliability, and is that stepping stone to these kind of more ambitious plans to the moon and beyond. And this is the Dragon capsule. Yep. It re-entered, uh, travelling uh, at about 350 miles an hour, we understand, when it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, and at about 18,000 feet, they deployed the first two parachutes. You can see the four parachutes now that were deployed a little later, and they expect to slow down from 350 miles an hour to around 15 miles an hour before that splashdown, again, off the coast of Florida. SpaceX have managed to get this down to some kind of art form now, Matt, it seems. The consistency is there. This is a crude mission again and setting themselves up for further success, it seems. That's right, yeah, and they're ahead of the other la uh, launch partner, which is Boeing, the Scott, mm. um, a Starliner, which is due to come into service to do similar splash missions. Splashdown is there, so we can see splashdown off the coast of Florida. That is the Dragon capsule. This is Crew 7 that were up on the International Space Station for around six months. The mission took off August of last year. And that looks like a successful splashdown off the coast of Florida then, Matt. Yeah, the, the next exciting step for SpaceX uh, is the third test launch of their big Starship. You might remember the last two uh, have kind of gone up with, with big explosions, although they've, you know, kind of uh, delivered the kind of um, milestones they set for themselves. So we might see that next Starship launch as soon as this week. Um, it's all kind of ready to go. Mm. Uh, and that obviously is a really important step as part of this broader NASA Artemis mission, which is to take people back to the moon, because the Starship, the kind of big silver thing that sits on the top of this 120-metre rocket, uh, is um, the SpaceX uh, lunar lander. So they need to kind of demonstrate that they can send that up into space and they can actually manoeuvre it. And you know, ultimately, maybe kind of 26, potentially, is the current... Um, target uh, year for the first lunar landing by NASA using either this or the Blue Origin lander. I think I imagine this one will be the first to go given SpaceX is ahead of uh, Blue Origin in development. OK, really interesting. So Starship is the next one to watch this week, potentially yeah. as well. So a busy mm -hmm. week for SpaceX. Again, as we look at the capsule there, floating, the Dragon capsule floating off the coast of Florida. The manned crew, of course, four individuals in there and, of course, waiting to be picked up around 19 hours after they undocked from the International Space Station.
live photos for you, live pictures, live images, of course, of the Dragon Capsule, SpaceX's Dragon Capsule. Let's get back then to central bank policy. What a shift. And bring back in the expertise of Takahida Kiyuchi, executive economist at Nomura Research Institute and former BOJ policy board member. Takahida, thank you so much for waiting patiently for us. You yeah. had said prior <laughs> to me interrupting you there that you expect a 70% chance that they do move uh, the Bank of Japan next week. What, what about yield curve control? They've talked about not rushing to unwind the easy monetary policy, even if they do move out of negative rates. What happens once they move? What is the synchronization for the Bank of Japan? Yeah, I think that the one media reports that the BOJ will cancel, uh, abolish that the yield curve control, uh, together with that the uh, cancellation of negative interest rate policy, maybe as far as soon as next week. I think it's possible. It's possible because at the BOJ concern that in the process of increase of short-term interest rate, uh, that could cause that uh, uh, how to say turbulence in the uh, bond market to increase at the increase of uh, long-term yield to prevent to reduce this kind of risk. Uh, BOJ may cancel that the yield curve control and introduce that the new uh, bond purchase target. I think it's, it's uh, likely, and the BOJ may continue that this new uh, uh, JGB bond purchase uh, uh, policy uh, with a target until that the BOJ will implement that the quantitative uh, tightening policies. I think that it could be the case in the next week. Anyway, BOJ is likely to introduce. It's possible that BOJ will introduce that the transitional measures of quantitative easing policies after the cancel of YCC, maybe even next week. OK, so they could cancel YCC yield curve control as soon as next week, but then we look for those new additional measures coming through from the Bank of Japan. Takahide, uh, how ready uh, is the market, not just the market of Japan, but global markets, how ready are they for this? Or is there a risk of market rupture on the back of this move? Yeah, I think the financial market already discounted that uh, high, uh, with a uh, cancellation of negative interest rate with a high probabilities. And that could not cause that big damage to that, the stability of financial market in a global. But I think that the financial market may shift its uh, concern from that the timing of that uh, uh, rate hike, but that uh, BOJ's mind type policy after the cancel, uh, cancellation of the negative interest rate policies. So I think that the uh, financial market uh, concerned that the rapid increase of short-term interest rate after the cancellation of negative interest rate. BOJ explained that, that uh, uh, it is not likely short-term interest rate will not increase rapidly even after the cancellation of that negative interest rate. However, I think that the part of that, the, some of the market participants may concern that the BOJ will increase uh, short-term interest rate rapidly because it's likely that the B, uh, BOJ declared that the uh, achievement of 2% inflation goal before, uh, before cancellation of the negative interest rate. At that, if that the 2% mm. inflation goal achieved, both inflation rate and inflation expectation will remain at 2% in the futures. Under that conditions, new to a level of short-term interest rate could be above 2%. So I think that the, okay. uh, if that the two percent inflation go achieved, that the, it's not justified that the BOJ will keep that the low interest rate uh, for a long time. Yeah. So in this way, I think that the uh, market uh, concern that the BOJ may increase at the interest rate rapidly. That kind of speculations mm. may cause that the increase of long term yield and increase at the sharp, sharper appreciation of the yen. That okay. could undermine the stability of the financial market. That could be a risk. OK. Takahide Kuyuchi, really appreciate your insights this morning. Executive economist at Nomura Research Institute and former BOJ policy board member who has a view that there's a 70% chance that the Bank of Japan increases rates next week for the first time since 2007. Thank you. Now to the corporate tech space in the US. Oracle shares are on track for their biggest gain since December of 2021. That's after the US company reported a spike in bookings in its cloud computing business, showing progress in capturing 
more of the competitive market. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Charlie Wells for the details. How much and to what extent does this set Oracle up then for a good year ahead, Charlie? Yeah, so they had a very good earnings report. And look, uh, earnings per share were $1.41. That beat estimates of the consensus, which was $1.38. And, you know, Tom, there is a war for the clouds right now. And this mm. is an incredibly, you know, competitive space in the computing sector. You know, Amazon's been doing well. Microsoft has been doing well. So this was a huge boost for Oracle and probably the reason why we are seeing that share price improve so much in extended trading. And look, revenue from cloud was up 25% in the quarter. So that's a huge boost. This is an area that really matters to them. And they also indicated that they are going to be spending about $7.5 billion in capital expenditure in this fiscal year. Mm. And a lot of that's going to data centers, which could help boost, boost some of this cloud infrastructure. Okay, Charlie Wells, thank you very much indeed on the prospects and the turn fortunes, it seems, for Oracle with the gains coming through for the cloud part of that business. Charlie Wells, of course, breaking that story down for us. Going to be more live pictures now. Cross back out to Florida. We have live shots of the splashdown of the Dragon capsule. SpaceX's Dragon capsule manned crew. Four members inside that capsule just off the coast of Florida. Splashed down a couple of minutes ago after de-linking from the International Space Station around 19 hours ago. The crew originally took off in August of last year, a six-month mission that has now come to an end. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.